A murder at a children's club in the city of Kherson. The director of the children's club, Skilled Hands, Emma Petrova, was found dead in the room where culinary classes were held. The body was discovered by her subordinate, Anna Davidova. She brought the children to the sewing and knitting classes and saw her boss on the floor with a fractured skull. The expert determined the victim received a heavy blow to the head with the solid body of a meat grinder. The time of death was at least 12 hours ago, meaning the previous evening. The blow hit the parietal bone of the skull. A fragment pressed into the brain, causing bleeding. Death was instantaneous. The fingerprints on the meat grinder were erased. The deceased's colleagues told investigators the classes ended at 7 p.m. yesterday. Everyone left, and Emma stayed behind to clean up in the kitchen. In her class, she baked cookies with the children. The dough was passed through a meat grinder. Perhaps this was the first thing the murderer grabbed. When asked what could have caused the tragedy, the employee said that everything went wrong for Emma from the morning. Her son-in-law came into the club and a scandal erupted. From snippets of the conversation, friends understood that the man was demanding money from Emma, talking about his desperate situation. Emma flatly refused him. The son-in-law was in such a state that he could have returned and killed Emma. After he left, she cried. She said she was not crying out of fear for herself. She felt sorry for her daughter, who was suffering in a marriage with such a man. They were always in debt. The husband did not want to solve family problems. Emma's personal life could not be called happy either. She was a widow. Her husband died eight years ago. She lived in an apartment with her elderly mother. The staff knew that Emma had a man who lived separately. He sometimes met her after classes. His name is Nikolai and he works as a driver. Where? No one knew. Emma loved her job. She felt at home in the children's club. The kids adored her. She taught how to cook simple and delicious dishes to several generations of residents in this district. Mothers enrolled their daughters in Emma's class and laughing, asked her to teach the girls how to make garlic toasts, just as she once taught them. The employees tried to help the investigation, suggesting different theories. For several months in this district, apartments have been regularly burgled. Maybe burglars sneaked into their club, and Emma, staying late at work, became an involuntary witness to their crime. But on the other hand, there was nothing to steal from them. A few groceries, fabric scraps, knitting threads. Who would break in for that? The investigators let the women go. Detectives understood criminals only in rare cases switched their criminal professions. Burglars won't kill, and robbers won't go into a children's club for loot. Moreover, everything was in place in the victim's bag, a makeup kit and wallet. In the wallet, 37 rubles, 79 kopecks. Gold earrings and a ring remained on the victim. At that moment, the son-in-law was the only suspect. However, if the murder was about money, why didn't he take the valuables? In any case, it was necessary to get to know him better. Natalia, the daughter of the victim, met the detective. He decided not to inform her of her mother's death immediately. He asked her to call her husband, Oleg Derevyanko. When asked where he was the previous evening, Oleg replied, at home, hoping his wife would confirm this. Natalia stated the opposite. Her husband only returned at one in the morning. He was nervous and arrogant, demanding dinner. She asked what her husband had done. Only then did the detective inform her of her mother's death. From Natalia's reaction, it was clear. She believed Oleg was the killer. She reported finding 1,500 rubles in his jacket while her mother had withdrawn a significant amount from her savings the day before. The detective detained the suspect. Natalia shared that she had long wanted to divorce him. However, every time she got close to making that decision, he would change, bringing money home, giving her flowers, and helping around the house. Hoping for the best, Natalia would change her mind. When the detective asked how Natalia knew about the large withdrawal, she explained that her mother had visited and shared her plans. She and her boyfriend, Nikolai, decided to get married. Neither of them had hopes of getting a state apartment for free. However, they had enough money to invest in a cooperative apartment and buy a car. They agreed to split the cost. Emma withdrew three and a half thousand rubles. She gave some money to her daughter to buy a winter coat and hat, asking her not to share the money with her husband. Natalia said that she had made the purchases and was in a good mood. But in the evening, her husband arrived. Seeing the new items, he became furious, accusing her of having a wealthy lover. To soothe Oleg, Natalia had to tell him about the money her mother had withdrawn. 
she immediately noticed her husband was plotting something. Indeed, the next day, Emma called her daughter and said her son-in-law had come over demanding a thousand rubles. Natalia attributed the constant lack of money in their household to her husband's passion for card games, losses, and perpetual debts. Emma had chosen a man entirely different in character, without bad habits and optimistic. Emma introduced him on Natalia's birthday. Natalia had mixed feelings after their first meeting. Nikolai constantly watched Emma and stopped her when she wanted to drink, saying she had enough. Emma wasn't used to being ordered around, but she obeyed Nikolai. Natalia did her best to lighten the mood. She didn't know Nikolai's exact address. He lived in a dormitory. More information could be known from the grandmother, Glafira, the mother of the deceased Emma. The detectives found used gold jewelry in Oleg's pockets. Natalia didn't recognize any of it. Before the interrogation, Oleg's fingerprints were taken. He did not deny asking his mother-in-law for money. He had nowhere else to get it from, and he had debts to pay. He admitted to playing cards and recently had been extremely unlucky. But his mother-in-law refused to lend him the money. He explained the 1500 his wife found in his pocket as a lucky win. After being denied by his mother-in-law, Oleg went to an underground casino where card players gathered. He was lucky for the first time in six months. He won enough money to pay off his current debts and still had some left over. The same goes for the gold. One of the players, Veniamin, had nothing to pay with so he bet gold jewelry. Oleg insisted that his presence at the card table was his alibi. However, he wasn't sure if any game participants would want to discuss it. The news of her daughter's death devastated Emma's mother. Glafira considered her granddaughter Natalia to be a foolish and lazy freeloader, always living off her mother's money. About Nikolai, her daughter's partner, she spoke with caution. According to her, the man had served a long prison term for murder. At one point, Nikolai moved in with them and started renovating a room. She didn't like this. He was bossing around in someone else's apartment. As if Emma didn't have enough with her always begging daughter and son-in-law, she brought Nikolai into the house as well. A man should provide for a woman, not the other way around. Emma screamed and Nikolai heard. He rushed into the kitchen with a hammer in hand and threatened the grandmother, demanding that she leave his girlfriend alone. He later moved out of the apartment. Glafira didn't know where to find her daughter's partner. He supposedly worked as a driver at a construction site. The grandmother found a photo of Nikolai and gave it to the detective. None of the construction companies in Kherson recognized Nikolai from the photo. However, it turned out that the gold items found on Oleg during the search were connected to apartment thefts in the area where the Skilled Hands Club was located. During the detective's meeting, Nikolai entered the cabinet. He said he had just learned of the murder of his fiancée. It turned out he worked as a driver at a granite quarry in the suburbs of Kherson. He returned from his shift and went to see Emma at work. They told him everything there, so he immediately went to the detectives. Nikolai put 3,150 rubles on the table. This was Emma's money, which she had withdrawn from her deposit. Nikolai said he knew what might have led to the crime. At their last meeting, Emma seemed troubled. He noticed it and asked her what was wrong. Her answer sounded strange. Emma said she was disappointed in someone close to her. She refused to name the person, saying she would sort everything out herself. Nikolai's information seemed more aimed at confusing the investigation than helping. The detective said that they knew about his criminal record. Nikolai confessed he indeed had served a long sentence for murder. He caught his wife with a lover. Rage took over and he attacked both. The wife survived, but the lover did not. There was no reason to detain Nikolai. At that moment, the detectives were informed that a man had appeared in the underground casino where Oleg played cards. The owner was a well-known figure in the city's criminal world, nicknamed Sava the Bald. He tried to run from the detectives, but was caught. Reluctantly, Sava admitted that on the day, Oleg had beaten a famous burglar named Veniamin Kislenko at cards. The detectives realized that the jewelry seized from Oleg might help solve the series of apartment thefts in the district and perhaps even lead to solving a murder. The door to Kislenko's apartment was open. The detective realized he was too late. Veniamin lay dead on the floor. The arriving forensic team determined that the murder occurred three days prior. Veniamin had been struck in the head with a hammer. An open suitcase filled with belongings indicated that the man was planning to leave. 
possibly because of gambling debts. In the kitchen, they found garlic toasts. The detective remembered. A club employee had said that the murdered Emma had taught how to make it. A handmade teddy bear was on the sofa, next to the suitcase. The detective remembered seeing a similar teddy bear in the children's club. As far as he remembered, the craft class was led by Anna Davidova, a young club employee who had discovered Emma's body. Of course, the toy in the burglar's house could have been a mere coincidence. But there were already two murders in the case, and it was essential to trace the chain, how the knitted toy ended up in the burglar's house. In Anna's apartment, the detective found a woman whom Anna introduced as her friend, but the detective immediately understood. She was a black marketer dealing in items brought by sailors from abroad. In the trader's hands was a list of items chosen by Anna. The total cost was 850 rubles, a huge sum considering a monthly salary of 100 rubles. Anna hurriedly said that she had saved this money by denying herself everything. The detective took both women to the police station. An expert informed over the phone that Anna Davidova's fingerprints matched those found in the murdered burglar, Veniamin Kislenko's house. The detectives discovered that Anna had dated Veniamin five years ago and even planned to marry him. But shortly before the wedding, the groom was arrested for burglary. However, as his fiancée, Anna visited Kislenko in prison. The detectives obtained a search warrant. They found 15,000 rubles and gold jewelry in Anna Davidova's apartment. Anna couldn't explain the origin of the valuables, but they were quickly identified as stolen from apartments. The detective presented Anna with the forensic results. Microscopic traces of Emma Petrova's blood were found on her coat. Anna started arguing that everything happened accidentally, that she herself was a victim, and the children were to blame, having provoked her with their chatter. Working with children, Anna knew many details about their family life, parents' earnings, savings, and the naive kids even told where adults kept money and valuables. Chatty and envious, Anna relayed information to the recently released Veniamin Kislenko. He proposed the crime scheme. She asked children for details and records the necessary information, and he would go to the given addresses and commit burglaries. Anna wanted to refuse, but Kislenko painted pictures of their future lavish wedding and luxurious life. That's how the gang was formed. From November 1976 to February 1977, 11 apartment thefts occurred in the district. A week before Emma's murder, an apartment in the same building as the children's club was burgled. Galina, the grandmother of one of the girls from the club, had a costly jade ring stolen, a gift from her late husband. Emma Petrova remembered that ring well. Galina wore it often. It was this ring that gave Anna out. On the evening of the murder, Emma was delayed in the kitchen, needing to wash dishes after baking cookies. Anna offered to help and suggested they walk home together afterward. Emma told her she didn't need to wait, but just asked her to close the windows in the room. Anna placed her purse on a chair in the kitchen and went to close the windows. Suddenly her purse fell, spilling its contents. Emma wanted to put everything back and spotted the familiar jade ring. She pieced everything together. Anna realized that Emma now had direct evidence of her involvement in the burglaries. She grabbed a meat grinder and struck Emma on the head. The young woman blamed everything on her fiancé. He was the one who instigated her involvement. She trusted him, but he just gave her minor gifts and had no intention of marrying her. That morning, she managed to find some of the stolen gold items in his apartment. Among them was the jade ring. She put them in her bag and went to work. That evening, Emma saw the ring and Anna had to kill her. Later, she went to Vinyamin to tell him what had happened. Kislenko immediately said they needed to lay low and avoid seeing each other. It was better for him to disappear. He decided to run away, leaving Anna behind. She realized he no longer needed her, grabbed a hammer, and struck him at the back of his head. For the murders of Emma Petrova and Vinyamin Kislenko, Anna received the maximum penalty, 15 years of imprisonment, 